This presentation is going to give you a general overview of pre-stressing technology. By the end of this presentation, I want you to be able to list and explain the major steps in pre-tensioning and post-tensioning procedures, list and explain the three different techniques used to minimize end region stresses while maximizing moment capacity at midspan, differentiate between unbonded and bonded construction for, for, and behavior for post-tensioning, illustrate typical post-tension system and strand profile and label the important characteristics, Use the given procedure to create a post-tension strand profile and detail uh, its geometry. And finally, uh, estimate the friction loss and set loss uh, using the given expressions for uh, post-tension structures. There are many uh, techniques and technologies that are required in pre-stressing to make the concept of pre-stressed concrete uh, viable or possible. Um, there are two main types of pre-stressing operations, uh, at, which we'll talk about in, in this lecture, um, pre-tensioning and post-tensioning. The main difference between pre-tensioning and post-tensioning is when the str strand is tensioned. In pre-tension oper operations, the strand is tensioned before the concrete's placed. Um, so we need these end blocks or self-stressing beds um, to hold the stress in the strand um, before the concrete's placed. Uh, then the concrete is placed and allowed to harden, and then the strands are cut, uh, which transfers the stress from the bed into the beam, uh, which places the uh, pre-compression into the concrete. Uh, the other way to uh, pre-stress a beam is using what's called post-tensioning. In post-tensioning, the strand is stressed after uh, the concrete is, is allowed to harden. Um, so here we have a, a concrete member with a, a duct placed internally where the, the strand will be run through the duct. Or you can place the strand with some kind of sheathing, um, which uh, allows uh, a bond to not be developed or pre prevents a bond from being developed between the strand and uh, the concrete. So you, you uh, cast the concrete um, without the strand or with a, the strand that's debonded. Uh, then you come back after the concrete's hardened and you stress the strand using uh, um, end um, anchors. Uh, so these anchors will be the, the main point of uh, transfer of stress between the strand and the concrete um, specimen or, or concrete member. Um, so then you come back and add the anchor and then you would come back and add uh, some kind of grout or a, a wax or flexible filler um, in the duct to fill that, uh, that void. Um, so these are the, the main two types of pre-stressing, um, and we'll, we'll talk more about those in this presentation. So one of the most important components of our pre-stressed concrete members are the pre-stressing strands. Um, so our strands are typically made up of uh, seven smooth wires. Um, so six wires around a, a central wire, and these outer six wires are spun along the length, make, giving us our, our strand uh, shape. Um, the strands, or the stress in the strand is also often, or always ten, uh, transferred to our bed using these um, chucks. So this chuck surrounds the strand, um, and it grabs the strand and, and bears up against our um, end block in our um, pre-stressed concrete members. Seven wire strands are the most widely used type of pre-stressing reinforcement. Uh, we use seven wires in these strands because uh, seven circles are, are optimal for tight packing of a, a, a circle. Um, so I guess seven is the lowest number of uh, tight packing and also uh, 19 circles would be kind of the next optimum number. Uh, but typically we use uh, seven wire strands. Um, the most popular sizes of these strands are three eighths inch, uh, half inch, um, half inch special, uh, which is a little larger than a half inch strand and uh, six tenth inch strands. Um, so for, for the most part, um, half inch, half inch special and six tenth strands are the, the three most common um, strand sizes. Uh, research is being conducted on larger strand sizes. So um, 7 tenths strand is being researched and um, has been used in, in some applications. 
Grade 270 um, seven wire strands are still the most common. So these strands have an ultimate strength of two, 270 KSI and a yield strength of about 243 or 245 KSI. Um, so Grade 300 strands are also being uh, researched right now. Um, so the future pre-stressing may be towards a, a higher strength um, strands. Um, all seven wire strands have standard diameters and standard areas. Uh, so shown here are some of the, the standard uh, diameters and areas for uh, seven wire strands. Um, so you can see our, our half inch diameter strand has an area of uh, point uh, 153 square inches um, and our 6 tenth has a little larger area, 7 tenth a larger area and you can also see um, you can also get what's called a half inch special strand. Um, so these strands have a little larger diameter than the half inch strand and also a, a little bit larger of an area uh, than the um, half inch diameter strand. So when designing um, you should use these, or designing or, or analyzing, you should use these standard areas um, to find the um, area of your, your provided pre-stressing. Deformed pre-stressing bars are also available um, to use in, in pre-stress applications. Um, these pre-stressing bars um, have a lower strength than our pre-stressing strands. Um, so you can see here the typical ultimate stress for these bars is 150 KSI. Um, so the, I'd say the pre-stressing strands are the most commonly used um, pre type of pre-stress reinforcement. Um, but these pre-stressing bars are available and uh, can be used in spe special applications like um, post-tensioning adjacent uh, members together. Some other types of uh, pre-stressing tendons are, are shown here. Um, so the first is in uh, a lot of post-tension applications, um, you can have multi-strand tendons. Um, so here we have a, a number of or several seven wire strands that are making up one uh, tendon uh, for post-tension post applications. Um, you can also have multi-wire tendons. So these would be individual wires making up one tendon um, and then also individual wires. Um, so some of these are, are less commonly used, but the multi-strand tendons are um, commonly used for uh, post-tensioned uh, structures. On the next few slides, we're going to go through uh, general pre-tensioning op operations. Uh, we'll start by looking at the different components um, that make up a pre or make up the pretensioning operations, and then we'll move to the pretensioning uh, procedure. Um, one of the main uh, components of our pretension operation is the end block. Um, so these end blocks need to be able to res resist the um, the force that's applied from your pre-stressing strands. Uh, so you can imagine there's a lot of force that's provided uh, or that's caused by these pre-stressing strands. So these end blocks require a, a large foundation um, and you know they're really beefy. So you can see here um, a typical or an example of a reinforcing scheme um, for one of these uh, end blocks. In a pre-stressing bed, we'll have one end that's called a live end. And the live end is the side where the strands are being stressed. So this is where your actual jacks are um, to stress your strands. The dead end is the other end of the structure. Um, and this is the uh, side of the bed where your strands are just anchored. So the strands are anchored on the dead end and they're stressed on the live end. So the, the last three major components in a pre-stressing bed are the softener liner that make up the, the bottom of the member, so it's, it's the bottom side of our formwork. Um, the header or bulkhead, which is the um, end form uh, for our member, and then our, our side forms for the member. So in typical pre-stressing plants, uh, these components are metal. Um, so th this allows them to use the same formwork over and over again. Um, so that's why we have standardized section shapes in a lot of uh, um, pre-stress, pre-tension applications um, because these metal forms um, are, are very expensive. Um, pre-stress plants 
also can have um, carpentry shops to be able to uh, do special wood forms um, to be used, you know, a, a couple of times on, um, on a unique job. In uh, a plant that doesn't have the end blocks that we described on the last two slides, um, the metal forms can also be called what's uh, can also be self-stressing. Um, so these forms are are designed to hold the um, pre the force from the pre-stressing uh, in the form itself. Um, so some plants will have uh, self-stressing forms versus um, having end blocks. On the next few slides, we're going to go through the typical pre-tensioning procedure. Uh, the first step is generally this, the strands um, being run along the length of the bed and chucks being placed at the end of the strand to anchor against the um, end block on the, on the dead end. Um, so after all the strands are, are run, um, you can see the um, spools of, of strand at the end um, typically used to um, yeah, allow the strand to be run for all the all the different strands. Um, after the strands are run, then the strands are, are tensioned to uh, an appropriate stress or force. Um, and this is typically done using a um, single strand jack. Um, so this jack would stress uh, each strand individually. There are two main methods for uh, stressing our strands in a, a pre-tension operation. Uh, the first is using a single strand jack. Um, so a single strand jack stresses each strand individually. So you stress one strand and then you move to the next strand and the next strand, um, measuring the elongation of the strand um, every time you uh, apply the stress. Um, the second procedure is um, multi-strand stressing or called gang stressing. And this is uh, where you have um, a number of jacks that are used to stress all the strands at the same time. Um, the most common procedure for stressing strands is just using a single strand jack um, and that's just because of the the cost um, required for the fabrication of a, a system that can do multi-strand um, or gang stressing. After stressing the strands the reinforcement is then placed in the beams. Um, most of the time a precast plant will then weld all the reinforcement themselves. Um, so here are a couple examples of that. After the reinforcement is placed, then the uh, side forms and, and the rest of the forms are uh, placed on uh, around the beam. Um, so here, here are two examples from uh, a PCI big beam competition that we did a, a few years back. Um, so you can see the reinforcing cage on the inside, um, the strands are stressed, and uh, we have our side forms um, and the uh, end forms here. So uh, the beam is now ready to cast. The uh, concrete um, used at precast plants can be mixed at the plant. Um, so this is common. Uh, concrete or precast plants will often have what's called a batch plant where they mix the concrete at the facility. Um, they can also work with a ready mix producer to um, ship in the concrete and have it uh, brought in. Um, so the typical, or these are some pictures of typical casting, um, again, from our, our big beam competition. So first the concrete cast.
After this, uh, internal uh, vibration can be used to consolidate the concrete. And then finally, uh, trowels and uh, screeds can be used to uh, finish. As I had mentioned, um, most precast plants will have uh, some batch plants or a, a batch plant on site to mix their own concrete. Um, so these are some pictures of a um, one batch plant, batch plant, um, where they have their raw materials stored and they um, use a conveyor to bring up the raw materials into um, a, their mixing chamber, um, where they'll mix up all, all their uh, materials and then um, put it in. Uh, concrete truck or, or a, a hopper to move around to, to place at the plant. After the concrete's cast and the members are finished, uh, the members are then moist cured. Um, so they can either be moist cured or in colder climates you can use um, steam curing to um, accelerate the uh, hydration process of the concrete. Um, after the concrete reaches uh, a required release strength, the strands can be cut. Um, these strands are typically cut using a torch where um, the strand can be first warmed um, and then cut with the torch. Um, there's a procedure for doing this uh, so that the stress can be more gradually transferred um, from the bed into the beam. Um, if it's done abruptly, then you can get some uh, additional cracking in the end region of beams. Um, after the strands are cut or um, possibly before the side forms are, are removed. Uh, so after the side forms are removed, then the beams can be moved out of the bed and into storage at the plant um, or uh, into storage at the plant and then they're ready to be shipped out to the job site. Um, the turnaround procedure for creating these beams is typically between 16 and 20 hours. Um, it, as I had mentioned, uh, metal side forms are typically used, and the um, end blocks and the, the cost or the cost of the side forms and the cost of the end blocks um, make plants want to uh, be able to turn over their beds uh, each day. Um, so one set of beams is typically cast um, per day per bed at a at a pre at a pre-stressed plant. Some Pre-stress members have internal voids um, and require a, an additional step in the, pre, uh, pre, in the procedure that we talked about. Um, so for internal voided members, there are two main different types of members. Um, so members where the internal void is created by the cast in place deck at the top. Um, so one example of these are, are U-beams. So a, a U-beam can use a steel internal void because uh, there's no top portion um, on the member. Box beams have an internal void that is not exposed to the, out, uh, to the outside. Um, so typically uh, box beams or the void in a box beam can uh, be created um, using a styrofoam void uh, that stays in the box beam um, after it's cast because uh, the beam is, has concrete on all sides and then also concrete um, at the ends. So there's no way to get the box out um, after casting. There are uh, two different casting procedures for these members with an internal void. Um, the first is a single stage procedure. Uh, in this procedure, the, the void is put into place before casting of any of the concrete. 
Um, so the void's put into place, and then the, you come back and you cast the concrete all at once, and you um, count on external vibration um, and the flowability of the concrete to ensure that concrete gets um, under uh, your void. Um, the other procedure is, is called a two-stage uh, monolithic casting. Um, so a, in a two-stage cast, um, you first cast your bottom layer of concrete, and then while, the con while that first layer is still wet, you come back and, and place your, your void immediately after that first layer is placed, and then you come and place this uh, second um, layer of concrete um, while the bottom layer is still wet so that you don't get a, co a cold joint right at the bottom. Um, so the two-stage procedure is, um, I guess, a little more time sensitive, but it helps to ensure that you have uh, concrete um, across the whole width of uh, the bottom of the beam, uh, so under that void. So shown on this slide is an example of what can happen if you do a single stage uh, monolithic cast, um, but your concrete's not flowable enough. Um, so you can see here in this U-beam, um, there's a, a large void um, that in the concrete that happened uh, under the um, void in, in the U-beam. Um, so this is an issue with uh, single stage casting. If, if your concrete's not flowable enough and, and you don't and or you don't have enough uh, external vibration to get the concrete under there. Shown on this slide are a couple pictures of the two-stage casting procedure. Um, so you can see here the concrete is first cast on, uh, on the bottom of the member. Um, then they place the void uh, in the member and then cast the concrete uh, on top. Um, so then the concrete is allowed to, to flow under, or, or sorry, um, the concrete fills the sides and also fills um, on top. Of the member. The next thing I want to talk about are uh, some ways to reduce our end region stresses. Um, in our pretensioned concrete beams, um, the stresses in the end region often control our design. Um, so at these end regions, we have our strands, or we can have all of our strands at the bottom of, of the member, um, and at, when we're re releasing, um, we don't have any moments at the end region to um, kind of counteract the stresses that are caused by the, um, the strand eccentricity. Um, so this leads to uh, high tensile stresses that can develop in the top of the member. So two of the main ways to reduce these end region stresses are, are shown on this slide. Um, the first is called harping. Um, so with uh, harping, you have um, strands that are placed at an angle. Um, so there's typically a hold down point at the middle. Uh, so the strand can have the maximum eccentricity at mid span where um, the moment demand is the highest. Uh, and then at the end of the region where the, there's mi minimal moment or no moment, um, you can get your strand um, higher in the section uh, or even get, you know, get your strand at, at the uh, center of gravity of the, the section to um, result in zero stresses. Um, but ultimately, uh, this is one way to um, reduce your end region stresses. The other way is uh, called debonding. And in debonding, what you do is you put a sleeve or uh, you put something around the strand um, at the end, or put something around some of the strands in the end region um, to prevent bond from happening between the strand and the concrete. Um, so doing this uh, allows the strand to not um, start developing until further into the section. Um, so what you can do is you can debond a different number of strands a different length, um, which will reduce the tension um, in the end region by reducing the strand area um, at, in that end region. Harping can be done with a uh, combination of um, hold up and tie down devices. Um, so you can see here a, a couple different devices to um, hold down the strand at mid-span and hold up the strand um, at the end of the uh, at the end of the members. Um, so you know, again, these are, are fully stressed strands. Um, so these devices uh, need to be designed to be able to hold the strand down. Um, so this can be a dangerous uh, procedure. You know, it's like pulling back a, a bow and arrow. 
um, but it, it's required if you're doing um, harping. Another option for reducing your end region stresses is by using top strands. Um, so by putting uh, some straight strands at the top of the section, um, you can decrease your end region stresses and you can also help to control your camber. Um, these top strands can be fully stressed or they can be partially stressed. Um, you can add, you know, kind of customize how much stress is in the strand based on um, what your, your uh, stress demand is at the end of the section. Um, but yeah, so they, they can be either. Um, shown here are, are some top, is an example of a slab beam in Florida. Um, you can see four uh, partially stressed top strands um, in this section. Um, having these top strands can also help with your, uh, your cage construction too. So, you know, there are, are some benefits to having them. Next, we're going to go through the typical procedure for post-tension structures. Um, the first step in the post-tension uh, construction procedure is to um, place your post-tensioning ducts um, in the formwork uh, together with your passive reinforcing cage. Um, so shown here are some internal ducts that are uh, placed in a, a curved U-beam. Um, so you can see the white internal ducts in the um, reinforcing cage. Um, so these are, are internal ducts again, which means they're inside the, um, the precast uh, member. Um, you can see that there's some intentional wobble that's placed in these ducts. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but uh, this can be done to reduce your um, losses that happen uh, in, in the post-tensioning. So after you have the reinforcing cage constructed with, the, um, with your ducts um, inside the cage, if you're doing an internal post-tensioning, uh, then you can place your formwork around the cage and the ducts. Um, so here, this is some steel formwork that's used for these curved uh, U-beams, and um, this formwork is unique in, it, in that it allows uh, kind of for adjustable radiuses um, for these curved, curved U-beams. After the formwork is placed around the member, uh, then the concrete's cast. Um, it's then cured and the formwork's removed. Um, so here are some of the, uh, these curved U-beams uh, after the concrete's cast and after they've already been, uh, been cured. Um, so you can see here the uh, post-tensioning ducts coming out the end. Um, we have some reinforcement that's extending out of the beams. So this will be used to help connect adjacent members. Um, and then, yeah, you can see the kind of curved profile for these curved U-beams. Um, for these beams, there was uh, some bottom post-tension tendons. Uh, so there were some bottom post-tension tendons that were um, stressed uh, before these beams were taken out to the uh, construction site. And um, these tendons were just used to uh, resist some self-weight and, and stresses caused by handling. After the uh, beams were constructed, next they're taken to the construction site and they're connected to each other using some post-tensioning. Um, so you can see here, the beams are initially supported on the uh, supports, and uh, also some temporary shoring is off, often required in post-tension operation to hold up some of these beams before um, post-tensioning ties everything together. Um, so yeah, the beams are placed, then the uh, post-tensioning is run through, um, these uh, closure regions are, are cast, and then the post-tensioning is, is tensioned. So uh, here are some additional photos of the connection region, um, the uh, end region of one on post tension segment, and uh, some holes left for uh, casting of a, a diaphragm um, to tie together adjacent members. Shown here is an, an additional uh, photo of, of the construction of this bridge. Um, so again, you can see the uh, curved profile of these uh, curved U-beams. Um, so this is a, a st structural type that's um, being used now and uh, to be competitive with um, some of the, the curved steel superstructure options. Here's an overview of the entire project um, using these curved U-beams uh, while it's still in construction.
And here is a uh, overview of the entire project uh, after construction was finished in uh, 2016. The last step in the post touching procedure is to fill the um, the air voids that are left in these uh, these ducts. Um, so these these ducts can be either filled with uh, cementitious grout. Um, so if they're filled with cementitious grout, then we'll have what's called bonded um, post tensioning, or the space in the ducts can be filled with uh, a grease or a wax. And if a grease or a wax is used, then uh, you have what's called unbonded um, post tensioning. Um, in Florida, um, all inclined tendons uh, must be filled with what's called flexible filler or a wax. Um, and, and shown here are some of the procedures for, um, I guess, placing placement of this wax. Uh, so the, the wax comes kind of as a, a semi-solid and it melts when it's heated. Um, you can use barrel, uh, these band heaters to uh, melt the wax. Um, and then the wax can be injected um, using a, a vacuum injection procedure uh, to ensure that the entire um, duct is, is filled with wax. Um, so ASBE, a national organization um, with the American Segmental Bridge Institute, uh, has some trainings to um, help or to certify people in either um, cementitious grout or, or wax placement. Um, so you can look at, at the ASBE website to get some more information on um, how, the, uh, how this grouting or, or wax injection procedure is actually done. So whether a, a duct is filled with wax or grease or it's filled with um, cementitious grout, is going to have a, a tremendous effect or impact on the behavior. Um, if you have grease or wax, you're gonna have um, an unbonded behavior. And in these systems, you're going to get, uh, as you apply a load, you're gonna get normally one or maybe two large cracks that develop in the structure. Um, so you'll get these large cracks and the strand stress is going to be constant along the length of the member. Um, with cementitious grout, you get a, a bonded behavior um, because the strand is going to bond with the cementitious grout, which will bond to the um, surrounding concrete. Uh, so as you apply a load, you'll get uh, the strand stress changing along the length. Um, you know, so we can use normal beam uh, theories to um, come up with what the stress in the strand is at any section along the length. Um, and, and you'll get a, a distributed cracking. Um, the unbonded, the only place of transfer uh, between the strand or stress transfer between the strand and the concrete is at the um, anchor regions. Um, with cementitious grout, uh, the stress is transferred, um, I guess, at the anchor region, but also um, between the strand and, and the surrounding grout because of the, the bond stresses there. Care needs to be taken um, when designing a structure with both unbonded post-tensioning and bonded pre-tensioning. Um, for example, like a, a splice girder. Um, in these members, uh, depending on the amount of unbonded post-tensioning and the amount of bonded pre-tensioning, um, what can happen is uh, because of the unbonded post-tensioning, you can get uh, primarily one or two large cracks, um, similar to unbonded behavior, which we talked about on the last slide. Um, and what this can do is lead to a stress concentration in the bonded pretensioning um, at the location of that crack. Um, so essentially at this crack, the bonded pretensioning is developing on each side. Um, so you'll get a, a stress concentration at that location. Um, so this can cause for a kind of early failure of these um, bonded pretensioning strands at the location of, of this crack. Um, so when designing these systems, you just need to um, right, make sure that you don't get this, this spike that causes early failure of these uh, pretension strands. In post-tension operations, the sequence of post-tensioning is important for um, design. Um, 
So in post-tensioning, you're, you're tensioning the strand, and the strand is bearing against the concrete. And as you tension that strand, the concrete's going to, to deform. Um, so if you stress all the strands to an equal stress, or an equal initial stress, you're going to end up with different stresses in all the strands. Um, so if I were to stress the first strand here, um, it would deform the concrete a certain amount stress the strand two, it's going to further deform the concrete, um, causing the stress in strand one to decrease. Um, so, you know, as you would work through, you would further deform the concrete, um, which would, you know, further decrease the, the strand and all the preceding, um, or the, decrease the stress in all the preceding strands. Um, so this is something that needs to be accounted for. Um, you know, it, can be taken care of uh, if you would go back through and then re retention um, some of these preceding strands again. Um, you can kind of eliminate some of that uh, that effect. Next, we're going to go through a couple components that are unique to post tension structures. Um, the first is the end um, anchor. So this anchor. Uh, is the point that transfers the stress from the um, strands to the uh, concrete member. Um, so there are many different proprietary systems and hardware for uh, this post-tensioning in an anchor region, um, depending on the size of the tendon, so the number of strands that are in your tendon, and the arrangement of the tendon. So whether you have um, a, a circular arrangement here or you can have like a, a flat tendon profile um, for post-tension slabs, um, there are different um, uh, or different systems and hardware that can be used. Um, so many manufacturers produce these. So you can uh, you can search the internet um, for for some of those. The um, ducts of adjacent members also need to be coupled together between um, segments. So there are are coupler devices that help to connect these adjacent ducts. Um, there are also vents that are um, inserted in, in these ducts, and um, these vents uh, help to ensure that the duct is completely filled with grout. Um, so during the grouting procedure, you would uh, fill the um, tendon with, uh, or the duct with grout, um, let the grout kind of flow out of these ducts until you uh, get a certain amount flowing out, and then you can cut off the vent. Um, and this way, if you have a couple of these vents along the length of the beam, you can make sure that um, your, your duct has enough uh, grout in it to, to completely fill the, uh, fill the grout or fill the duct. On the next couple slides, we're going to talk a little bit about the profile of post-tension tendons. Um, so these post-tension tendons typically have a parabolic shape. Um, and they can be a, a series of, of uh, parabolic segments um, to vary the strand uh, for uh, location for continuous structures. Um, so for simply supported beams, we only have a maximum moment in the middle. Um, so we could have a, a single or one parabolic curve with maximum eccentricity at midspan. Um, in continuous beams, uh, we'll have a negative moment over the supports, um, so we can line up a series of parabolic segments to make sure that we have um, the strand as uh, close to the bottom of the section as possible uh, at our maximum positive moment region and, and as close to the top of the segment as possible for our negative moment region. Um, so you can see here um, in this two-span continuous structure, we can have a series of, you know, here five different um, parabolic shapes or segments to make up the overall strand profile. Um, note that there needs to be a continuity of slopes between these parabolic segments. Um, having a continuity of slopes between segments ensures that you have a smooth transition in the duct. Um, if you have a sharp transition, uh, this can lead to um, kind of premature failure of the strand um, at, at the location of, of the, the sharp corner. Um, so anyway, we'll talk on the next couple slides about how to ensure that you have that um, continuity of slopes. So before looking specifically at our PT tendon profile, um, we'll first remember uh, the general geometry of a parabolic profile. Um, so you can see here, uh, it's kind of a general shape for our, uh, our parabolic curve uh, based on E naught 
and uh, x, the distance along the uh, length here. Um, we can then find our slope, dy dx, um, related to our, our e naught, our l naught here, and, uh, and the distance along the, the length of the um, strand. So when we're considering the, our parabolic shape of our uh, tendon profile, um, we want to figure out an, an alpha and a beta here, so the location of our transition between our, our parabolic shapes, um, so that we have a, a smooth transition in, of uh, our slopes here. Um, so what we're going to do is, based on our eccentricity, um, E2 and, and E1 required by our positive and negative moment designs, um, and our, our length between spans, um, we're going to figure out a beta and a lambda um, such that we have a, a smooth transition between slopes uh, for adjacent um, parabolic segments. So this procedure is um, an iterative procedure, but the, uh, the first thing that we would do is we would start by um, selecting an alpha and a beta, just uh, kind of based on the geometry of our, our section. Um, we then use our descriptive geometry to find the um, transverse location of our transition point. Um, so we can find our H2 dependent on our um, beta and our alpha that we calculated, and our E1 and E2, which are our, our eccentricities that we found from our uh, flexor design. Um, so using these, we uh, have kind of our, our initial geometry. Um, after we guessed or, or kind of selected our, our lambda and our beta values, um, we can then find the radius of our curvature. Um, so our, the radius of our, our curvature here, um, it can't be too small or else we're going to have problems with our friction losses and we can have some issues with strand fraying or, or strand tensioning. Um, so some of the minimum radius, uh, or, yeah, radiuses are, are shown in this table. Um, and these minimum radiuses are dependent on the um, inside diameter of our sheath or, or duct. Um, so if we find a radius uh, from our uh, lambda and beta that we selected, uh, if we find that that radius is less than these minimum radiuses, then we would need to go back and modify our lambda and our beta um, to I guess, get our r greater than our minimum radius. Um, so after we would do that, then you know we have a strand profile that we could uh, we could use. Um, another thing to consider when you're coming up with the eccentricity uh, required for your duct is the the fact that the um, centroid of your ducts and the centroid of your strands or your tendons, um, won't be the same. Um, so the the strand at the uh, or at the lower portion of your duct, um, when your duct is towards the bottom of the section, um, when you tension the strands, the strands are going to go to the top of the duct. So your center center of gravity of your strands is going to be uh, higher than the duct center line. I'll contrast this with at the top of um, or at, over the um, supports where you have your duct towards the top of the section, um, your center of gravity of the strands is going to be below the duct center line. Um, so, you know, when you tension the strand, the strand is going to want to go to the bottom of the duct. Um, so, you need to consider this additional eccentricity um, between the duct center line and the center of gravity in your strand um, when you're figuring out the actual location of your strands um, for your post tension design. Shown here are some standard values that you can use for this eccentricity or the uh, eccentricity between the um, duct center line and the center of gravity of your strand. Um, so typically a tendon size will be um, or will consist of 19 strands. Um, so you can see if you have a, a 19 strand duct with an uh, inner plastic duct diameter of 3.94 inches, um, you'd have an eccentricity of 0.83 inches between the, um, you know, again, between the center of, of your duct and the center of gravity of your strands. Um, so if you have 19 uh, 6 tenth diameter strands, then that um, eccentricity is a, a little smaller. Uh, 
Uh, next, we're going to talk about losses uh, that occur during the post-tensioned uh, or post-tensioning process. Um, so essentially, when a tendon is jacked, uh, there's going to be friction that happens between the tendon and the duct. And uh, this friction is going to cause a, a loss in the pre-stressing force or pre-stressing stress in the in the strands and in the tendon. Um, so there are two main components of friction losses that we'll look at. Uh, so we have a, a curvature loss and a, a wobble loss. So we'll uh, look at both those. So these friction losses uh, result from a change of angle of the tendon profile. Um, so essentially, if we have our, our live end where we're, we're stressing our strand um, over some distance, uh, we'll have some kind of loss to that um, to that force on our dead end, uh, dependent on our strand profile. Um, from equilibrium on the uh, using the free body diagram on the previous slide, we can calculate the normal force, uh, which is normal to our duct. Um, so you can see our normal force is dependent uh, on the um, force that's applied in the tendon and uh, the uh, angle from our um, our, our tendon. Uh, so we can take that normal force times our friction coefficient uh, to figure out the amount of force that's lost um, from friction. The um, post-tension strand or post-tension tendon is also going to undergo um, a wobble friction loss. Um, and this loss is due to the intended profile being different than the actual profile of the strand. Um, so this wobble loss uh, is a, a factor of this kappa, or the which is the empirical wobble coefficient. Um, and this is dependent on the uh, rigidity of the duct, the diameter of the duct, the spacing of duct supports, um, the type of tendon that you have, and also the, the form of construction. Um, so uh, specifications will have different kappa values um, that you'll use to determine your, uh, your wobble uh, friction losses. So combining these uh, two types of friction losses, um, we can uh, come up with um, a procedure for calculating our um, total loss in force in the tendon, um, which is dependent on a, a friction coefficient, a wobble coefficient, um, the total angle change between two points, and also the total length um, between uh, two points in your tendon. So we can use this, this equation then to calculate the um, total loss um, in our, our post-tensioning due to our uh, friction losses. Um, shown on this slide are some recommended ranges from uh, Collins and Mitchell um, for our uh, friction coefficient and our uh, wobble coefficient. Um, so you can see here some, some ranges for different um, tendon types um, and different uh, types of ducts. And uh, shown here some uh, additional recommended values from uh, CBFIP uh, for tendons where you have a, a radius of curvature um, greater than 20 feet. If your tendon is reasonably long, um, there's going to be a considerable loss in the force along the length. Um, so along the length on your live end, if you stress the strand to 70% uh, of its yield stress, um, at the dead end, you know, maybe you, you would only have 50% of the yield stress um, that would carry over because of all, all of your um, friction and wobble losses. Um, so what you can do for longer strands or longer tendons is you can stress from one end first and then you can come back and go to the other end and stress from the other end and uh, what this will do is um, it'll decrease the uh, um, or I guess it, it'll increase the stress in, in the tendon along the length. Um, so here the the loss at mid-span um, would only be 60 percent or, or sorry would be 10 percent so you go from you know 70 percent stress at the end um, to the tendon having 60% of the yield at, at mid-span. 
You'll also have um, anchorage or set losses that occur. Um, and these happen uh, as you um, transfer the stress from your jacking device into the um, anchor that's actually going to be there. Um, so in a lot of times you can overstress the, the tendon at the end um, so that after the um, after the, the anchor, anchorage and set losses, um, the stress decreases down to uh, you know the acceptable ranges. Um, so then you can do this at both ends and get a fairly consistent um, strand profile or, or uh, strand stress along the length of the tendon. Another note, um, during the um, jacking procedure uh, for pre and, and post tension applications, um, you can uh, measure the actual elongation. Um, so here you can measure the, put a mark on the strand and measure the actual elongation that occurs and compare it to the expected elongation. Um, so in pretension applications, uh, typically the um, expected elongation needs to be within 5% of the actual elongation. Um, if it's more than that, then this might uh, mean that there's some kind of jam a jammed cable um, somewhere or you know, another issue in the, uh, um, with, the, with the jack or with you know, your uh, instrumentation or um, something along the, something's uh, wrong. As mentioned, another type of loss that'll happen is called an anchor set loss. Um, so this type of loss occurs as you're transferring the stress from your jacking equipment into your anchoring device. Um, so typical um, set losses are about a quarter inch. Um, so the strand will kind of decrease in, uh, or will slip about a quarter inch. Um, and this will cause a loss of uh, stress and force in, in at the end region of your uh, your strand. Um, so you can figure out your anchor set loss using the procedure shown here. Um, so essentially you find your um, slope and your force profile of your strand. Um, you figure out the length um, of your set loss, your L set, um, which you can calculate uh, using this equation here. And then um, using your L set and your slope that you found in your fo force profile, um, you can find the um, total force that'll be lost um, in your uh, tendon profile. Um, so we'll look at an example in a couple slides uh, to help you understand how to, how to use this. So uh, Astral RFD uh, bridge design specification has a um, similar or has similar expressions uh, to what we've been talking about. Um, so you can see here uh, the um, losses due to friction between an internal pre-stressing tendon and the, the duct wall um, can be found using um, this expression. Um, so this, this has the same form as uh, what, what we've been talking about. Um, this equation is, is based again on our uh, wobble coefficient or wobble friction coefficient um, and also our coefficient of friction. Um, so we can uh, use these um, based on given values in ASHTO to uh, solve for our, our fr uh, total friction loss. And uh, shown here are some, um, or are the values that ASHTO um, requires to be used for our, our wobble coefficient and our, our friction coefficient, um, depending on our wire or strand type and also the um, type of duct that we're using. Um, so you can see here the wobble coefficient is the same for all of them, but the friction coefficient um, changes based on the uh, if wire or strand are used um, in you know different types of uh, ducts, so you know metal or, or plastic or uh, rigid steel pipe. On the next couple slides, we're going to go through an example problem uh, where we find the um, friction losses for a four-span a four-span continuous bridge um, with 20 six tenth inch diameter strands um, that are, have an ultimate strength of uh, 270 ksi, uh, and they're stressed simultaneously to 75% of ultimate um, from both an ends and then anchored. Um, so you can see the uh, parabolic segments and, and how they're defined here. 
Um, and also note that uh, this is a, an example that uh, was modified from um, Collins and Mitchell's uh, textbook. In this example problem, we'll first uh, calculate the tendon force variation after anchorage along the length. Um, and then we'll also uh, calculate the expected elongation due to the strand operation. Um, you can see some of our, our given values here for mu and kappa. Um, yep. So uh, we'll start by determining the tendon force variation along the length. Um, note that the mu alpha plus kappa x values for each parabolic segment uh, will first be determined. So we'll, we'll find those along the length. Um, and since each parabolic segment has one end with a, a horizontal or zero slope. Um, our alpha, our angular change within each segment is going to be equal to the slope at the inclined end. Um, so we'll see on the next slide uh, what that means. So the, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to break down our tendon profile into a, a series of um, profiles where we have zero slope at one end. Um, so we'll have our, our first segment with zero slope at one end, um, second segment with zero slope at one end, uh, third segment with zero slope at uh, over the center support, um, fourth kind of the mirrored uh, with zero slope, um, fifth and sixth both have zero slope at uh, this point here, and then the seventh with um, zero slope over the center line. Um, so because each of our segments has zero slope on one side, um, we can find the uh, total angle change between two points um, using the uh, right taking the two times our um, eccentricity at one end plus the eccentricity at the other and then divided by the um, total length of that segment um, so here we have zero eccentricity at the end um, two and a half feet eccentricity at um, the right end and the total segment length is 45 feet um, so here we can see that our total angle change um, will be um, 0.111 radians uh, along this segment length. Um, so doing the same thing uh, for each segment, um, we can get the, uh, the following values there. Next, we want to find our mu alpha plus kappa x component for each one of our segments. Um, we found our alphas on the previous page, and our x is just our segment lengths. Um, so we can use our mu and our kappa values that were given um, to calculate this parameter for each one of these segments. Um, so going along the length, we can find our, you know, for segment one, this parameter will be um, 0 0.049. And, you know, we can just find them for each, each segment along the length. Um, so, you know, I encourage you to, to calculate these um, yourself to make sure that you can uh, get the same values. Um, after that, we can sum all of these values uh, at each of our, uh, at the end of each one of our segments. Um, so at the end, our summation is zero. Um, at the end of this segment one, we have zero plus 0.49. At the end of our segment two, we have 0.49 plus 0 0.006 to get our next value. Um, and we just keep working, uh, working our way up. Um, until we get to the, our center line. Uh, then we can take e to the negative of that summation, um, and we'll see the, the values here. So at the end of our beam, uh, this uh, parameter will be equal to 1, and it'll decrease uh, as we move along the length. So next we can find our total applied force um, at the end, not accounting for any losses. Um, so we just take our, uh, the strands were or the tendons were stressed to 75% of their ultimate st stress. Um, so 0.75 times our 270 KSI, and then take that times the total area of our um, pre-stressing, which will give us a, a total pre uh, force in our tendons equal to um, 871 kips. Um, so to find how that tendon force varies over the length, uh, we take this force times the um, parameter that we calculated on the uh, previous slide. Um, so we can find then the force at the end of each one of our segments. And you can see that, uh, so before set losses, which is where we're at right now, um, our 
tendon stress is going to decrease um, over the, the length of the strand uh, up until mid-span. And then on the other side of mid-span, we'll have a, a similar um, tendon force profile because um, we're stressing uh, at the other end um, using the same procedure. You can also see here uh, our tendon force after our set loss. Um, and we're going to talk about how we can find that set loss on, on um, some of the next slides. To find the uh, expected elongation in our tendon, uh, the first thing that we need to do is find the average um, force in the um, tendon along the length. Um, so to do this, we can uh, take the force at the left end and right end of the seg of each segment. Um, so find the average uh, stress and take that times the segment length. Um, so we can do that for each one of our, our segments that we found um, and then divide that by the total um, length of our segment. So the summation of all of our uh, segment lengths uh, and that'll give us our average um, force in our, in our uh, pre-stressing tendon. Um, so then we can take that force, so the average force times the length of our tendon um, divided by the total area and divided by the stiffness of the tendon. And that'll give us the uh, total expected uh, elongation of the tendon during um, stressing. Finally, we're going to find the uh, anchorage set loss. Um, so the first thing that we need to do is we need to figure out the tendon friction loss per inch. Um, and to do this, we need to uh, make some assumption of whether our anchorage set loss is going to occur in the first um, segment or if it's going to extend in the second segment. Um, so I'm going to assume first that the um, anchorage set loss is going to uh, uh, occur all in the first segment. Um, so we'll find our tendon friction loss per inch by just finding the slope um, of our force in, in, in our tendon uh, within this first segment. Um, so left end minus right end divided by uh, total segment length to give us a um, tendon friction loss per inch um, in this first segment. Um, using this uh, p-value that we found, uh, we can plug it into our uh, length of our set loss expression that uh, you know we had from a few slides ago. So um, we're assuming here that uh, we have a, a set or yeah, a delta set of 0.25. Um, our tendon area is uh, 0.3 square inches. The stiffness of our, our pre-stressing steel um, and divided by this p-value give us an L set of 52 feet. Um, so we can see here that this 52 is greater than um, 45. Um, it's close. It's, you know, within about 10%. So, um, you know, we're going to just kind of move forward in our calculations. Um, but if, if it was significantly different, then we could go back and recalculate a tendon friction loss per inch, assuming that, you know, now we're into that second segment um, and then recalculate an, an L set. Um, so, you know, because we're, we have a small difference, we're just going to, um, keep going with uh, with this tendon friction loss and, and uh, L set value. So with these values, then we can figure out our, to our total set loss. Um, so essentially, we just take uh, two times our um, P, our uh, tendon loss per inch, uh, our tendon force loss per inch, and then take it times the total length uh, L set. Uh, which what we found to be 623 inches on the last slide. Um, so plugging these in, we get a total um, set loss of 97.2 kips. And we're assuming that this is happening in the first segment. Um, so here we can see after our anchoring force, we have uh, at the end, um, our force at the end goes from 871 kips, um, taking out the set loss down to uh, 773.8 kips. Um, you know, so we're we're decreasing the the stress and force in the tendon at the end by you know a, again about uh, 10 percent, 11 percent. So uh, that concludes uh, this lecture on uh, general pre-stressing technology uh, for pre-stressed concrete design.